Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa mursaleen. Just uh, double checking it to see if it's working. Inshallah. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa mursaleen Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Afdal salatin wa taslim. Welcome everyone to our uh, second, uh, third session, inshallah, our second session, inshallah, on uh, lessons from the cave. Uh, inshallah, uh, today we're going to be continuing with the uh, overall theme of uh, the chapter of the cave. Um, like last week, inshallah, I'll be proceeding um, a little bit slowly in terms of um, the pace, just to build up a few uh, key concepts and ideas and then uh, I'll move uh, faster, inshallah, from next week onwards. So what I want to do first today um, is start with um, the uh, summary of what we did last week. Uh, last week, we covered in introduction to storytelling. And we looked at the fundamental elements of what I think are the unique characteristics of the Quranic stories. I did point out that there were several unique characteristics, but the ones I listed last week were um, the fundamental fact that the stories were brought down, tanzil, that they were divinely authored. And so one has to analyze them and look at them as, uh, as such. They can't be compared with human text and therefore uh, they defeat the notion of narrative as we uh, normally understand it um, in human text. We also have to bear in mind that the uh, Quran is a what consists of weighty words called thaqil, and that the effect of the words um, is profound on the listener and the receiver. Uh, we looked at uh, briefly at how the Quran is quite a primordial language, and that it, it creates uh, verbal images through the use of very um, visual, imaginative, um, uh, uh, and powerful metaphors and symbols. Uh, and the, the effect, the weight it bears on human beings is similar to uh, the crushing weight uh, of, the, uh, of the divine word as it um, enters into human language. We also looked at the uh, non-linear nature of the tartib, the order of the Qur'an, and we uh, addressed the important issue of how the Qur'an uh, is a discourse that addresses the entire human being. And I gave several examples of how the Quran does so uh, through the fundamental use of the imagination. Okay, um, last week there were several questions um, and there were a number of questions and comments on the, uh, the page that I, I am gonna address quite quickly. Uh, one of the questions was, what is the Islamic conception of human psychology? And uh, it is a pertinent question in regards to uh, a deeper understanding of the Quran itself. Uh, it requires a whole course on its own but I think the, um, the image or the diagram I produced last week from uh, uh, Abdullah Rothman and Adrian Cole is quite uh, an effective, uh, effective one and quite, quite comprehensive in many ways. Um, because one fundamental thing we have to bear in mind uh, about uh, the human being is that uh, we consist of uh, several, several um, dimensions or several levels. Um, we consist of spirit and by nature spirit is something that is not bound to uh, the material and the physical world. When spirit descends into body it is called soul. Uh, we, our soul has, um, or in, in, in the language of the Quran, there are three levels of the soul or the self, if you will. Um, there's the nafs al-muqma'inna, which is the highest level. Um, there's the uh, nafs al-lawama, which is the intermediate level, and there's the uh, nafs al-ammara basu, which is the lower self that draws one downwards. And you can see it here, um, colored here in red, the intermediate um, self here and the higher one uh, there. This model of the psyche is very useful because it presupposes the multiple levels of reality, the hierarchy of, exist of existence, 
and it pre presupposes a vertical axis and a horizontal axis. I'm going to come back to this vertical and horizontal axis a little bit later, um, but um, I'm not going to add uh, too much more on this particular question here. I refer you to the model uh, developed um, by uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah Rothman uh, because it is, it is very extremely effective. Um, the second question was, uh, does Surah Yusuf fit the description I did last week about how the Quran um, presents things in a nonlinear manner? And um, in, in many ways it does. Of course, Surah Yusuf is the Surah in the Quran that has uh, the most uh, continuous or the most continuous and coherent narrative in the whole Quran in the sense that it um, it con conforms to our uh, normative understanding of what a narrative is, which is it has a beginning, it has a middle, it has a climax, there's a problem, it's resolved, and it has a, 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 um, an end, or the hero of uh, the story somehow finds some kind of a positive uh, resolution. Um, in that sense, in terms of succession of um, events, it does fit the bill of a, of a narrative, but in many ways it doesn't. Because um, sometimes between one verse and the next, uh, the Quran leaps several decades. Um, and uh, in, in many other ways, uh, it's subtle references um, in between the verses. Sometimes there are allusions to, to other things. So while it is um, a continuous narrative, um, it's not a continuous narrative uh, in the sense that uh, we are used to with human texts. Um, and Surat Yusuf really often reminds me of, of something that I used to uh, point out to my students when I used to teach um, history of art and architecture. Um, and that is one of the most, um, one of the things one, one notices when studying Egyptian art, especially ancient Egyptian art, um, is the fact that it is quite two dimensional, symmetrical. Um, the reliefs uh, do not betray any sense of natural perspective or realism. Um, in, the, in, the, in the, the kind of art you find in the Renaissance, for example, or Greek art, where the, um, the art uh, uses a certain degree of perspective uh, and depth, and it creates a sense of, uh, of realism. So the, the individuals or figures are sculpted or painted in a very realistic way, or at least in the way the eye sees it. Egyptian art paints things as they are symbolically understood and perceived. However, and, and the argument of some art historians was um, Egyptian artists uh, couldn't paint realistically and therefore they had to uh, paint in a two-dimensional uh, non-realistic manner and that's a very false western assumption that was taught for many years in art history it's no longer taught that way uh, we know a lot more about Egyptian culture and civilization to understand that the manner in which they presented their art or they the manner in which they they, they sculpted and painted or um, it reflects their particular way of viewing the world and seeing the world. However, you do find occasionally in ancient Egyptian art, um, one or two perspectival paintings or one or two perspectival um, sculptures. And what this suggests quite interestingly enough is the fact that they did possess indeed the skills to do so. They just chose not to because it didn't accurately reflect the symbolic way in which they saw uh, the human form. And Surah Yusuf is very much in this sense, uh, for me at least, it proves that um, the Quran or the stories could have been told in a, as a continuous narrative. Um, and it almost uh, is a response to those who claim that Muhammad was so confused and, and, and um, uh, his, his thoughts were so muddled up that he couldn't really put together a coherent narrative. Um, and what the Quran or this particular story does prove is that indeed, well, it wasn't Muhammad who wrote it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was uh, divinely revealed, but the author, the divine author could have told the story in the Quran uh, in the way that we expect a story to be told, um, but he didn't do so because what the Quran or the world of the Quran that is unfolding before our eyes, um, the world of the Quran that it is opening up for us is one in which the simple tools of logical linear narrative simply do not uh, express or deliver uh, what is being um, revealed. <clears throat> okay, the fragmented, someone asked whether the fragmented letters that I talked about when I, when I described 
human language crushed under the weight of the divine word and somehow the, the fragments of those words are retained in the Quran as primordial sounds. Yes, they are the fragmented letters or the standalone letters that you find at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah and many other Quranic verses. Okay, so let's move on to the presentation of today. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, and explore the companions of the cave, inshallah. First, a general introduction to the surah itself and some of the narratives. Surah Al-Kahf was largely revealed in Mecca, so it's a Meccan surah. And one expects of the Meccan surahs, or Surah Al-Kahf, what one expects of usually of Meccan surahs, um, which is um, a preoccupation with um, God, divine will, divine qudra, uh, divine omnipotence. Uh, one expects the surah to um, be preoccupied with um, inculcating or teaching or educating or molding the soul of, soul of the believers according to a new aqidah, according to a new way of life, according to a new way of being. Um, and so one doesn't necessarily, or what one find uh, in it, uh, what one finds usually in the uh, surahs uh, or surah revealed in Medina, which is uh, sometimes a preoccupation with um, uh, the establishment of a state, um, society, laws, um, rules, etc., etc. One finds more of a um, narratives of old stories that are spiritually edifying, that are symbolic, um, and that are meant to uh, sculpt at the inner self of the reciter or the reader. They're meant to impress and move and evoke the otherworldly reality, alam al ghaib, that um, the deniers in Quraysh uh, couldn't believe in. There's only one verse, however, verse 28, that is, it is said in the tradition that was revealed in Medina. Now, many of you may or may not know that uh, when the Quran was compiled during the life of the Prophet, so when the verses were revealed, the verses were revealed in a certain chronological order, depending on circumstances of revelation. But when the Prophet uh, compiled the Quran together into a single uh, uh, text, um, the tartib or the order of the verses uh, was something that was done by himself um, under um, divine inspiration, of course, under the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and the tartib that we have of the Quran today, of the verses within the chapters, of course, um, is not the order in which they were revealed. And um, it, the Prophet ﷺ was also the one who gave the chapters their titles. What the Prophet didn't do, and it is something the Sahaba did later, they're the ones who arrange the order of the chapters or the suar in the way that we have them in the Quran. So beginning with Surah Al-Baqarah at the beginning, or Fatiha al-Baqarah, from the larger suar to the smaller suar, that was done later, and it was not done um, under the in direct instruction of the Prophet Wasallam. That's the majority view on this particular issue. Now, why this is important is because uh, there was a divine logic behind the particular uh, order of revelation, the way uh, the order of the verses is that they were revealed to the people of Quraysh. And uh, there was then a different order or logic uh, when it came to ordering the verses within the chapters. So these, the particular um, Surah Al-Kahf, uh, or many of the chapters within Surah Al-Kahf, not all of them, uh, or maybe not all the verses, but many of the verses most of, um, that we, we have before us um, um, were revealed as answers to questions posed to the Prophet Sallallahu So the Quraysh, who uh, increasingly felt the threat of the uh, prophetic mission, uh, wanted to embarrass the Prophet Sallallahu and wanted to, uh, in some in some part, test him. And so what they did was they wanted to present him with a challenge. And so they sent a delegation uh, to Yathrib um, to ask and consult the Jewish rabbis and scholars. And, and they said this to them, ask them about Muhammad. Uh, so the delegation said, uh, the, the Quraysh told the delegation, ask the rabbis about Muhammad describe him to them and tell them what he says, for they are the first people of the scriptures and have knowledge that we do not possess about the prophets. And so the delegation went to um, um, Yathrib 
And indeed, they met with the rabbis and they told them, look, we have this particular individual called Muhammad um, give us questions from you, from, from you that we can test him with and see whether he, in, indeed he is a, a, a prophet or a madman. And the rabbis um, said, ask him about three things of which we will instruct you. And if he, if he gives you the right answer, then he is an authentic uh, prophet. And if he does not, then he's a rogue or a man who has his own opinion on matters. And so they, they said, the questions were, ask him, so ask the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu what happened to the young men who disappeared in ancient days? For they have a marvelous story. And ask him about the mighty traveler who reached the confines of both East and West. And ask him, what is the ruh? And so if he answers you, then he is indeed a prophet. And if he doesn't, then he is a forger, a liar. And so they came back to uh, Mecca and they posed a question to the Prophet Sallallahu He paused for a moment and then said to them, I will give you my answer tomorrow. He forgot to say, inshallah. And later on, we're going to see that um, the surah, when it was revealed, um, admonishes the Prophet and reprimands him for not saying insha'Allah. And for that reason, revelation ceased for quite some time until eventually two weeks later, Jibreel alayhi salam came and revealed the uh, surah to the Prophet sallam, and the answers. Um, and the Prophet sallam, felt relief, but felt also embarrassment because um, he had, it seemed to the people of Quraysh that he was a liar because he didn't give the answer the next day. Um, and that also is referred to in the verses of the surah, as we'll see uh, in a minute. Now, the answers to the two questions about the youth and about uh, the, the traveler, the Qarnayn, are mentioned in Surah Al-Kahf. The answer to the question, Wa is revealed in, is revealed, was revealed with the uh, with these verses, but it's pla it was placed by the Prophet Sallallahu in the previous surah, Surah Bani Israel. Okay, so let's get into the uh, uh, chapter now a little bit more. Um, the, the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to read Surah al um, every Friday. And um, that's very, very interesting because of the virtues of Friday. The Prophet ﷺ pointed out several times that the Surah um, read every Friday would illuminate one from one Friday to the next. Um, and we know that Friday in Arabic is called Jumu'ah, is the sixth day of creation, wherein the human being was created upon the image of God. And some scholars describe this image of creating the human being um, as Jama'a Sifat fi Bani Adam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know in, in some traditions um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, created the human being as the only creature in, in, in the universe, in the cosmos, that is able to uh, manifest the uh, the divine names and gather them together um, in a single creature. No, no creature in the cosmos can do that. And so uh, one suggestion is that the name Jumah is called Jumah for this particular reason, because Adam was created on that. And on this day, Jama'a Allah has sifat fi bani Adam. A secondary meaning is because of this day of Jama'a, of the divine qualities and attributes in the human being, um, we perform the prayer in which we gather to celebrate that occasion. That's why Friday is so sacred and important for Muslims. Therefore, one could say that from every Friday, one is reborn. If Friday is a day upon which uh, Adam was created, the human being was created, then Friday is, uh, and if Friday is a day we read Surah Al-Kahf and we are renewed and purified and illuminated from one Friday to the next, it suggests that every Friday we are, as it were, uh, almost uh, reborn. <clears throat> now, I want to uh, uh, paint here an image for you, a diagram uh, to uh, convey uh, to a certain extent the uh, Islamic and Quranic understanding of uh, time. We can't really understand uh, Friday and its true value really without understanding um, this notion of time. Uh, because time and the bending of time, the suspension of time uh, in Surah Al-Kahf uh, is quite common. And we're gonna come across it several times. 
So the divine command or Amr Kun Fayakun, and so the cosmos, the universe, unfolds from this divine Kun. And as the divine Amr reaches, uh, and the divine Amr unfolds, manifest the divine names and their traces in the universe. We know according to many Islamic cosmological accounts that when Allah SWT says Kun Fayakun, the traces of his divine names manifest through the universe. And so in many ways, the universe consists of traces of the divine name, ayat that symbolize and refer back to the divine names, which we then refer back to Allah. <clears throat> and in this sense, in this sense, um, one could say that um, in a moment, a divine day is a moment, an instant. And I'll explain this in a minute. In the divine realm, there is no time or space. Time and space are created. There's a threshold of time and space. Um, and so in the divine realm, there is no time per se or space per se. Um, and that is why the Quran in many places refers to uh, a divine day as equivalent to a thousand days or human days or a thousand human years. In Surah Al-Mi'raj, for example, we read, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ta'aruz al-Mala'ikatu wal-Ruhu ilayhi fi yawmin kana miqdaruhu khamsina alfa sana. So the angels and the spirits ascend to him in a day that is equivalent to almost 50,000 years of our time. So here a day is like 50,000 years. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَيَسْتَعْجِلُونَكَ بِالْعَذَابِ وَلَنْ يُخْلِفَ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهِ وَإِنَّ يَوْمًا عِنْدَ رَبِّكَ كَأَلْفِ سَنَةٍ مِمَّا تَعُدُّونَ So here, a day is equivalent to a thousand. Yet they ask thee to hasten on the punishment, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not fail in his promise. Verily, a day in the sight of thy Lord is like a thousand years of your reckoning. In yet another verse in Surah Al-Sajda, يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ ثُمَّ يَعْرُجُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ مِمَّا تَعُدُّونَ He rules all affairs from the heavens to the earth. In the end, all affairs go up to him on a day, the measure of which is a thousand years of your reckoning. And again and again, the Quran goes on with several different kind of verses, of course, and in several traditions of the Hadith, we see that um, it refers to divine days or it refers to days in a divine realm or the Alam al ghayb that are either equivalent to 1000 years of our time or equivalent to uh, 100 or equivalent to uh, 50,000, which suggests that um, an instance in the law is equivalent to a long period of time and And when we say that an instance and Allah, we don't necessarily mean that God uh, has a certain kind of time. Um, these are expressions of the fact that um, in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual realm, uh, there are different dimensions of time. In the physical realm, there is human time, human realm. And so at the threshold of time and space at the threshold of the created universe as we know it the divine amr which is one beyond time and space uh, it fragments and shatters into <clears throat> the six days of creation sunday al ahad monday al ithnain tuesday al thulatha wednesday al arbaa thursday al khamis so all these days, the first day in the Islamic calendar, of course, uh, Islamic week is Sunday. That's why it's called al Ahad, it's not Monday. All these are numbers, one, two, three, four, five, except Friday. Friday is called al Jumu'ah. It's not called the sixth day. And then then a Sabbath, which means rest or uh, fixity uh, or repose. And <clears throat> this gives us the vector of time of our human week. And the reason why I visualize this in this manner is because to show you that a single point or a single point which is beyond the dimension of time and space for us in the physical 
uh, realm of the cosmos uh, is perceived as a vector, a flux. So if you look at this image here, it really, I think, effectively portrays a very important point. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is beyond time and space, the past, if we are here on Wednesday, the past, the present, and the future are ultimately all derived from a single instant, which is beyond time and space. But in our human existence, in our physical realm, this is stretched across a vector of time that we perceive as unfolding one after the other. This unfolding is for us. We perceive things as unfolding in this manner. And the reason why I'm a, um, showing you this diagram is to show you uh, a little bit or convey a little bit of the complexity of the notion of time in the Quran and in the Islamic tradition and how we can never really um, extrapolate from here to here. And so when the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to us events in the Quran. He sometimes describes the horizontal relationship between events, and sometimes he's describing the vertical relationship between events, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, well, I'll try to show you. I can't pretend to be able to uh, uh, show, you the, show you this entirely. Uh, I've done my best to try to do so, but uh, my knowledge is very, very limited. Um, <clears throat> but... Um, Within this human realm, there is a time and space, and time is perceived as unfolding of events over a linear sequence. Whereas in the divine realm, everything is co-present. So for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's only pure presence. <clears throat> pure presence. Um, he witnesses the past, the, the, the present, and the future, and all possibilities. As, a, as 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 uh, simultaneously, uh, simultaneously. So this is this is important to bear in mind. Um, and so the six days of creation that we see here, six days of creation, <clears throat> where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, in the Quran, He describes what He creates on every day. But the, the final day, the Friday, <clears throat> is the creation of the human being. So effectively, if every week of our week mirrors and reflects. Um, a reality from alam al ghayb and this is important to, to keep in mind because people often think the seven days of the week are arbitrary days you know they're conventional uh, ways of calculating the passage of time to a certain extent that's true but to a certain extent that is not true at all when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he created the world or created the world in six days and then um, rested on the seventh or istawal al arsh um, the, he, the, it's not uh, a reference to our days it's a reference to something in the divine realm that is co-present and simultaneous. Or some scholars describe the six days of creation or the seven days uh, of the week as seven moments, simultaneous moments within the divine realm or seven divine names that manifest. To us, they seem like separate things unfolding along a, 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 a vector. And this is important because then we have to distinguish between divine day and human day. And the human days are an image and reflection of the divine day. And the divine days or the divine moments through which he creates, and, and uh, we're not gonna get into what that actually means right now because it will get us off topic. But the seven moments of creation, the seven attributes that manifest to constitute creation are expressed and articulated in our human realm through the seven days of the week. And so each day of the week, according to many scholars, uh, retains a certain quality or a relationship to certain divine names and certain qualities in a divine realm that other days do not share. And Friday has its own unique qualities. <clears throat> And because it's the day upon which God created Adam, it is a day upon which we are constantly renewed and reborn. You see, creation in the Islamic understanding happens every instant, is constantly repeated. We can't experience that in every instance, only the divine can. What we can experience is um, the way in which this instant is stretched over seven days. 
So our seven days really are a slow motion video of seven days, which in the divine realm are really just one instant. And on that Friday is the day in which creation is renewed. So at the end of every week, creation begins again. Um, I hope that kind of conveys a little bit of the complexity of time. <clears throat> and so when we move on to uh, an image like this, we get uh, we complicate the image a little bit by introducing uh, that in the human realm, there are different kinds of time also. There is the outer time, Zaman al -Falki. that's the kind, well, the kind of time we use with our watches, the kind of time we use to measure um, our days and our hours. Uh, but then, then there's Zaman Anfusi, an inner time within us. There's an inner clock that measures events and measures things according to a different dimension of time. To give you a very simple, straightforward example of that, sometimes when you're in contemplation of something or watching a sunset or with a loved one, you've experienced time as either stretching or diminishing. You can experience eternity in an instant, or you can experience um, a, 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 a very short experience as a very long one. And this is because psychologically speaking, we experience time differently according to our different moods and our different experiences and our different inner realities. So even in, in even within the spectrum of our human psychological experience, we have different notions of time. Then can you imagine what kind of time there is also if we activate um, the, the, the reality of our inner spiritual essence? Again, when we enter into spiritual uh, uh, experiences, the experience of time also will be very different. And many of the Many of the kind of pop movies that you see these days that explore the reality of dreams like Inception and many other kind of movies really touch on a very interesting theme or that the movies kind of veer in a, in a very odd direction. But the central theme of time being experienced differently in different levels of the dream is very true. Uh, and so we also need to bear that in mind because often when we encounter events in the Quran, we ask ourselves, in what dimension of time and what dimension of space are these events unfolding? Are we meant to understand them as historical events, events that are happening outwardly? Are we meant to understand them as realities of the soul? Or are we meant to understand them as both? And a lot of the Quran can be read as both. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. And so we come to the theme of the cave. Now, as I said earlier, the cave, the chapter of the cave was given this title by the Prophet and um, although many of the traditional commentators don't necessarily comment thematically on the Quran, and by thematically, I mean, they don't take the entire chapter and say the overall themes of this chapter are one, two, three, four. Usually traditional commentators focus on a word by word, verse by verse uh, interpretation of the Quran, focusing on um, the narrations and focusing on the linguistic dimensions and focusing on theological issues and questions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not a popular thing to do in classical commentaries to look at the Quran as a, as a theme uh, or the chapters as a theme. Um, but in recent, among recent commentators in the 20th century, Quran commentators, uh, you find um, they develop this uh, deeper understanding of uh, Quranic themes or uh, a theme dominating an entire chapter. And so, when we look at Surah Al-Kahf, one might ask oneself, um, is it just an arbitrary coincidence that the Prophet titled or entitled the entire chapter Surah Al-Kahf? Why did he give the entire chapter the title of its first story? Uh, is there something deeper in this designation? Is perhaps the overall thrust of the Surah, does it suggest inward introspection and journeying? Is it, is, is it a call for uh, deep contemplation inwardly? Um, to enter into a cave presupposes an inward journey. Um, is that the uh, suggestion here? And we'll come, come to this uh, uh, later because um, I, will, I will try to develop this theme a little bit more. We also know that the first and last verses of the, of the, of the surah 
uh, or a protect protection against the tribulations of the grave and the Dajjal. Uh, we suggest that uh, we suggest that the surah is very important for an age in which, like ours, in which uh, we are assaulted on all fronts by an extreme materialism and atheism and destruction, unwanted uh, uh, consideration for uh, the environment uh, and for uh, um, our relationship to it. However, the, the four stories also highlight um, social, political, and economic principles that are vital for our age and the age of the Jal. Uh, perhaps one of the pertinent aspects of the chapter for us today, living in this post COVID-19 world where the environment is collapsing around us and where the uh, social, economic and political system is collapsing around us. Um, that there are social, political and economic insights in these four stories that I'm going to uh, explore with you that are very vital and they're principles. They're not detailed uh, teachings, but they're principles wrapped in a remarkable story um, that conveys uh, crucial insights for our time. Uh, another important point I want to highlight about the, the surah uh, um, as a whole is each of the stories highlights favors uh, that God gives to regular humans. So in the sutil, in, the, in chapter on the, the story of the companions of the cave and uh, in the story of the two men with their two gardens, in the story of uh, Musa alayhi salam and his servant, or the, sorry, the servant of God that he meets, and Dhul Qarnayn, all these stories are not really about uh, prophets per se, although the story of, of Musa alayhi salam and al-Khidr is one where the, a prophet is involved, what the story reveals to us is so more about Khidr than about uh, Musa alayhi salam, that the gifts that Allah can grant to a servant of God who isn't necessarily a prophet, although some commentators insist that he is a prophet. Um, Dhul Qarnayn was certainly not a prophet, um, and the companions of the cave were not prophets, and the two men in their gardens were not prophets. So, Unlike most of the other stories in the Quran that revolve around the graces and gifts Allah SWT gives to prophets, these are uh, refreshingly uh, about the graces and gifts that Allah SWT gives to people who are not prophets. The themes of the cave, um, some of the themes or ajaib aspect, the miraculous or marvelous aspects of the surah, surah, uh, surah the surah and the stories within the, the surah, uh, the sleepers of the cave, we find that time is distorted. With the two men in their gardens, uh, ecological thought is subverted. I'll explain this when we talk about the story itself. Moses and the servant, reason principles of cause and effect are suspended. Uh, Moses is baffled by what the servant of God does before him. And in the Qarnayn, space is mysteriously traversed or bended and he encounters uh, an odd race of people, a mysterious race of people. And so there seems to be a distinction between what happens, seen by the outward eye, Basar, and what is actually happening, seen by the inward eye of Basira. And so the stories are recounted or they're narrated to us or they're told to us, not by what seems to be happening in the stories outwardly, but what is actually happening through the bird's eye view of the, the divine. That's what makes the story so different from human narrations. The, the events are more than what can be seen through historical materialism. And so you find that when the uh, Allah Taala says, we relate to you their stories in truth and reality, what he's saying here is that our account of the stories reveals a truth and their reality in ways that the other accounts simply do not. And if you really compare the uh, Quranic uh, stories um, to uh, stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see that uh, it's revealing something that only someone who is privy to the most inward uh, mysteries and secrets of the event can actually tell you. And so one could say that the overall theme of the whole surah itself reveals the limits of knowledge that is bound by time and space. The sleepers defy time as we understand it. The two men and their gardens, the logic there uh, of uh, accumulating material wealth uh, 
which is how we tend to conduct ourselves in the physical realm or in terms of materialism is subverted. Uh, it, Moses and, and servant, uh, the knowledge that is bound by time and space, which is reasoned in principle causality is suspended. Uh, likewise was Zulkarnayn. And so the inexhaustible knowledge of God is beyond human accounting. That's the kind of, we find the underlying theme. Uh, I, I hesitate to say an underlying theme because I don't want to use it in a single term, a singular. Uh, there are many themes, but one of the profound messages that constantly comes across is this idea that human knowledge or knowledge that we assume to be knowledge is bound by time and space and therefore limited. And only God can gift us uh, an understanding of alam al ghaib and how it is connected to the seen world. So let's get into Surat al Kahf. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to recite the first eight verses. Um, I'm not, not going to comment on them now, uh, but I'll be coming back to some of the verses later. What I want to do is go straight to uh, the story of the companion. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدنه ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا حسنا ما كثين فيه أبدا وينذر الذين قالوا اتخذ الله ولدا ما لهم به من علم ولا لآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفًا إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَىٰ الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا لِنَبَلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَإِنَّا لَجَاعِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا صَعِيدًا جُرُزًا Now, I'm, I'm not going to read the English of translation of this. I, I hope you at home you have your own English uh, Quran that you're using uh, alongside this. Um, when I do comment on the verses, I will refer partially to uh, translations. So that's the end of the verses uh, before the story of Surat al uh, the, the sorry, the, the, the story of the of people of the, of the cave. Um, and we'll come back to some of the links between these verses and the stories. The companions of the cave, Ashab al kahf story begins at verse 9 to 12, uh, sorry, 9. Um, and on to 26. Um, and quite remarkably, uh, Allah provides a summary of the story in verses 9 to 12. أَمْحَسِبْدَ <laughs> فضربنا على آذانهم في الكهف سنين عددا ثم بعثناهم لنعلم أي الحزبين أحصى لما لبثوا أمدا. صدق الله العظيم. So uh, this is the summary. This is the first uh, first four verses that really provide a remarkable summary. In these verses, you have the whole story. First of all, the name and title أصحاب الكهف الرقيم, and then it says about how they went into the cave. And we gave them guidance and compassion from us. And then we put them to sleep and then we resurrected them. So basically, uh, the bare outlines of the story. And then the rest of the verses from 12 to 26 uh, get into a bit more detail of that, uh, of that story. Uh, what I'm going to do now in the next uh, 20 minutes remaining or 30 minutes remaining, inshallah, is provide a commentary on these four verses. Now I'm going to move slowly. And then hopefully next week, inshallah, I'll provide a commentary on the rest of the verses, but in a much faster manner, because next week we also have to do the parable of the two men in the garden. So <clears throat> let's start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Am hasibta anna ashab al-kahfi wa raqimi kanu min ayatina hajaba. And so the key term I want to highlight first is uh, this one, ashab al-kahf. Um, and Allah SWT does not refer to them by name. He rather refers to them as the people of the cave. Um, and this is an honorific, as it were, by naming them after the glorious cave they sought refuge in. But here the cave is transfigured. It's a sacred place of divine traces. 
in some of the traditions we read, souls have places, hearts have caves, and the spiritual wills, himam, have spheres of activity. Wherever one performs seclusion, i'tikaf is where one is sought. And what this quote, beautiful quote in one of the tafasir um, is suggesting is the idea that uh, really what defines us, uh, what defines us um, is not so much necessarily the names we are born with, uh, and the names of the, the, the companions are not, not mentioned here. Although in some of the uh, commentators, uh, they, they, they use um, many of the uh, 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 historical traditions from Al-Kitab, from the Old Testament, New Testament. The Prophet ﷺ once said that, Hadithu uh, Bani Israel wa la So narrate from the people of Israel. Uh, there's no issue with that. Um, so they use the narrations from Bani Israel to fill in the gaps, as it were, of the historical details of the story. But I want to stick to the Quran and the way it narrates it. The Quran doesn't refer to them by name. It's not, it's not important. It's not essential. Who are these people? These are people who performed ihtikaf in, in the cave, whose spiritual wills and the sphere of its activity, um, whose um, refuge in the cave was really a refuge to uh, God. And so Allah refers to them in this manner, not, not in terms of their historical names. <clears throat> And I'll come, I'll come to this uh, in a minute also again, Ashab uh, al I'm Hasipta. So the next uh, uh, word, few words that I want to comment on, Hasipta. I'm not Ashab al-Kahf, but I'm not Ashab al-Kahf, but I'm not Ashab al So do you consider them a wonder? Now, the addressee here is the Prophet Sallallahu first and foremost, but it also uh, every one of us. Any cursory look at the cosmos reveals numerous events that are more wondrous than the story of these young men. The Quran is telling the Prophet these, these um, Ahl Quraysh who went to the trouble of going to uh, the Jewish community in Medina or Yathrib in order to ask you a difficult question, thinking that this question was about something so marvelous. It is not marvelous. There are a lot more wondrous things in the cosmos than, um, than this story. And uh, if we, this is an image that I, I, I quite uh, uh, love. It's it's an image of an atom, um, but it, 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 within the atom, there are there's an entire universe of its on its own. Uh, we're not able to really pierce and penetrate deep into the world of the atom, but it reveals so much. And the atom and the structure of the atom resembles the structure of the cosmos itself. It looks like a microcosm. But indeed also uh, the prophetic Mi'raj, Israq al Mi'raj is something more wondrous than um, the story of the people of the cave. In the, in the commentary, they say that uh, Allah Taala is alluding to that the Prophet traversed the entire hierarchy of existence within a single night and came back to his bed and it was still warm, which suggests that the whole journey to Jerusalem and all the way up to the divine presence in spiritual time, as it were, or the time of the unseen was quite long. But in the material world, it was but maybe a few minutes because his bed was still warm by the time he came back. And so that is even more wondrous or even more so the verses of the Quran. The verses of the Quran are, uh, are more wondrous than the, the stories themselves. Uh, but why do we find the youth so wondrous? Of course, when we read the story, we, we, we cannot but marvel at them. Um, and that is uh, a, a natural response and reaction. They are marvelous stories. They are miraculous stories. But we find them quite miraculous, partly because we have ceased to see the miracles all around us. The Quran of all sacred scriptures always invites us to a vision of things as they really are. The Quran is always saying, look, the Quran is always saying, uh, consider. Um, it's always describing the wonders of creation, the creation of the camel, the creation of the, uh, of the, of, of the, of the, of the human uh, 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 within the womb, uh, the creation of the heavens and the earth. So it's always trying to turn our gaze to a vision of things 
as they really are, because if we are able to witness the reality of the cosmos as it really is, it consists of trillions of trillions of miracles at every fraction of a second. Every instance is a miracle. If we only have the right eyes to see it with. The Prophet Sallallahu used to always perform the dua, Allahumma arin al ashya kama hiya, O Lord, show us things as they really are. And as they really are, things are wondrous. We are up to our necks drowning in the wonders of God's creation and miracles. But sometimes the most uh, hidden things are the most obvious. And so the Quran really tries to uh, nudge us out of our complacency in order to uh, see the wonders all, all around us. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the, uh, I want to comment a little bit on the word fitya here because it's, uh, it's an interesting term. In the commentaries, they, they define fitya as <clears throat> youth or young men. But the commentators point out that the men who entered into the cave were not necessarily uh, young by age. They were young in terms of their spiritual state meaning fitya and futuwa in the Islamic tradition is, uh, refers to uh, a spiritual state. And I'll explain what this means. So it's not clear what age they are, but God refers to them by their mode of being. So the fitya reference here is to what they are, not their age, not their having, but their being as it were. In some uh, of the stories of Bani Israel, um, and in some Islamic commentaries, it is said that these were rich aristocrat aristocratic kids who, who even worked or uh, had a, their residence in the palace of the king. They were his advisors or his ministers. And so, but this is irrelevant. The, the fact that they had all this wealth is not how the Quran refers to them. The fact that, uh, because people who, there's just two modalities uh, the two kind of human beings, as it were. There are people who are defined by having, and there are people who are defined by, by being, as it were. Um, those who are defined by having are people who can only get a sense of self-worth and meaning in life by how much they have, whether it's uh, wealth, whether it's power, whether it's connections, um, or whether it's even knowledge sometimes. Um, but, and, and these people are constantly uh, anxious. They're constantly defined by uh, their outward trappings. Uh, their self is somehow has uh, projected all these anchor points external to itself. And so when these are cut, when we lose, or when this particular individual loses things, it's not so much a loss of what they have, it's a loss of themselves in the process, which is why they, they, they suffer uh, so much. And, but this is the condition of uh, many people in this world today, and which is why this story is so, so compelling and relevant today. Um, a true Muslim um, who submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like these, these uh, individuals did, are ones who are not defined by what they have, but are defined by what they are, their being, in the sense that they are mu'minun. Uh, they are, they don't have they don't have uh, Iman as an idea in their head or mind. They are uh, believers. And of course, the definition of believers in Islam, according to the definition of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that something that we have in our heart, something that we articulate in our tongue, and something that we do with our, with our limbs, with our body. And so someone who's defined by who they are, uh, defined by an inner state, uh, an inner hal, as it were, uh, of... Uh, being close to God, being uh, uh, thankful of God, being um, uh, forgiving of others. These attributes and virtues that uh, what define the good Muslim and the good spiritual Muslim are through Ihsan, excellence. Uh, these are attributes and qualities that so define the human being that they transform the individual internally and they transform the inner state in, in such a way that um, no one can ever take away uh, anything from them because uh, who they are 
who they see themselves as um, is defined uh, by what they are. Um, many Muslims and many people who claim to believe the first moment they confront um, their, their material wealth dissolves away from them. They're some, some people, not always, some people, their faith is shattered. And these are people whose Iman perhaps, or his faith, their faith in God is uh, something that they have. It's not something that they are. They have it in their mind, they tick it off a box, they believe in the Yom al Akhir, they believe in God, they believe in the prophets, they believe in the messengers. But this hasn't yet permeated their, their, their inner reality and become part of what they are. So there's a difference between believing and being a believer. Uh, or having a belief, sorry, is the difference between having a belief, this is more accurate, having a belief and believing, or having a belief and being a believer. Mm -hmm. So these are fit who are not defined by their outward trappings, by the fact that they may or may not have been aristocrats, by the fact that they may have had strong connections to the, the king, or that they were wealthy. They are defined, the Quran defines them by what they truly are. Everything else is an illusion, and their true identity the only authentic identity that survives death is the fact that they are fitya. And so they are those who have achieved a certain degree of spiritual realization. Futuwa in Islam refers to spiritual chivalry or spiritual excellence. And it is uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam as a young boy is referred to as a fatah. Um, and the tradition of futuwa in Islam uh, is, is started by the Prophet sallallahu the Prophet in his youth and in his spiritual excellence, of course, uh, and Imam Ali also in his spiritual excellence, they become the prototypes in the Islamic tradition, along with many of the other Sahaba of this ideal of, of how to achieve a spiritual excellence um, in one's, one's life. And later on, the Islamic tradition for Tuwa then accrues several more meanings, uh, especially in the tradition of the Sawwuf. And it becomes a state of being in this world where one is in this world, but not of this world. Uh, to be in this world is to be, to uh, not be of this world is mean means to not have things, or in other words, to put, to possess things and not to be possessed by things, as it were. So, um, awa is an interesting uh, notion to seek refuge, because it has a profound meaning here. It does not simply mean retreat to the cave, although. In its outward designation, of course, um, it does refer to the fitya who uh, re sought refuge in the cave or retreated to the cave. It has a deeper meaning of uh, seeking refuge both horizontally and vertically. And this is a, a very, very crucial point, uh, which we uh, should bear in mind um, in this COVID-19 uh, world we live in, where we are secluded in our homes. Horizontally, one seeks refuge by leaving the shirk of one's community and withdrawing from society. And indeed, this is what these individuals did. Horizontally, I mean horizontally along the uh, linear horizon of time and society and a material existence. Yes, they withdrew from a certain town. They withdrew from a certain milieu, certain context, and they retreated to a, a cave. This occurs on a horizontal axis perceivable with a physical eye and historical materialism. However, vertically, they also sought refuge. No mere physical or outward withdrawal from society suffices. They journeyed inwardly from the world to God. This occurs on a vertical axis. So human beings exist on two axes. A horizontal one, where we live out our psychological life from birth to death. We are children. We mature at adolescence and maturity, then um, we reach the age of 40, which is spiritual and mental maturity, and then we get older with old age. We live along, uh, we live in societies, we live in a physical world, we live in a socio-economic world and a political world. Um, that's a horizontal axis we live upon. However, it's very important to bear in mind that is, there is also a vertical axis and that no real progress um, can be made if it is only along the horizontal level. We, one may achieve a certain degree of social standing and achievement in society and life. 
one may move through life and achieve a certain degree of economic independence. One may grow strong physically and um, uh, one may grow strong politically. Uh, one may develop very astute psychological understanding and um, uh, uh, maturity. But if it's not accompanied also by a simultaneous spiritual growth vertically upwards, where we ascend, as it were, upwards to realize our a higher spiritual nature, then we are not really uh, uh, truly uh, progressing. And what these fitya did was, by all, by all uh, intents and purposes, socially they had withdrawn. So outwardly they seemed to have failed socially. They lived in a society that uh, didn't accept them anymore. They were non-believers and, and not only were they non-believers, but they persecuted them. And so they fled the society, they fled the economic and social and political world that we're living in. They, they physically separated themselves. So along this horizon, it seems that they, they, they were failing. Um, but that's not the measure. That's not the only measure of success because vertically they were soaring up. They were flying very high spiritually. And that's important to bear in mind in our normal life, we seek a balance between these two, especially where this horizon of our development um, is put at the surface of our spiritual development. And so a balance between these is very, very important. But there's two dimensions, therefore, to these fitya. There's their relationship vis-a-vis -vis society and the world, and there's a rela their relationship with, with themselves and God. So there's a horizontal relationship, and then there's a vertical relationship. And in one of the commentaries, it says, quite interesting, when they entered into the cave of Al-Fatiyatu Al-Gafi, they became absent to others, yet present to, with, and in us, i.e. God. They became absent to others and present only to God. And so this suggests that their retreat into the cave was simultaneously a retreat or khalwa into the inner chambers of their being, as it were, their inner world. The cave is often referred to uh, as Ghar uh, al-Unsi, the cave of intimacy, as it were, for it is known not by its physical quality, but by its spiritual quality. In the, some of the commentaries, they refer to the cave as Ghar al-Unsi, the cave of intimacy, because uh, rather than a cave that's cold and um, difficult to survive in, the intimacy of the proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what made it it's quite remarkable. And so the constricted space of the cave is expanded by uns, by intimacy, just like the space of the prayer mat is transfigured. When you stand on a prayer mat, you're no longer standing in pure physical space. Um, in the same way that when you stand on your prayer mat and you face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're no longer uh, located in a pure uh, horizontal uh, everyday time time becomes almost suspended as you enter into the divine presence. So when you're on a prayer mat, you're present to the divine presence in the present moment. And this is a, a, an example, a classic example from Salah of how we enter into different modalities of time and space every day. <clears throat> okay. Kahf. Kahf here is quite interesting. Uh, the Kahf appears in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ used to frequent Ghar Hira or the cave of Hira to be alone with God, uh, or what the tradition calls the practice of Tahannuf. So before he received his first revelation, he would ascend a mountain 540, 550 meters high, uh, six kilometers outside of uh, Mecca, a barren mountain. And towards the, just before the summit, 20 meters before the summit is a cave. And he would climb that mountain some traditions say that he would do it on a regular basis um, and spend a few days and then come back down um, to get back his provisions from Khadija, his wife. Um, sometimes Khadija would send him provisions with the servants halfway up the mountain. Sometimes Khadija herself would go halfway up the mountain and the Prophet would meet her halfway down. And since some traditions that he used to spend a month, a year up there meditating and praying. And Tahanath refers to the... Uh, 
the practice of performing a ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before revelation came and before he was taught um, the prayer itself. And this is a, a, a picture of the entrance to Ghar, Hadar, uh, the cave. And this is a picture inside. And you can see here, spending a month in this space here um, is not a constricted space because the, the, the sense of intimacy and uns with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the warmth of faith expands it indefinitely. The cave appears in many world traditions around the world. The cave is very interesting and considered a symbol. It's a symbol of the center, the omphalos, the center of the world, the shelter, the symbol of the heart. And so when uh, one enters into a cave in many traditions uh, around the world, one is considered a, a symbolic journey of returning to the source which is why it has always been a place of initiation. I used to teach a course on prehistoric art uh, during the Paleolithic period. And there are these wonderful examples of um, caves in Spain and France and Altamira in, uh, and caves of Lascaux and many other places uh, in Africa also. And it baffled scholars and archeologists as to why humans would go two kilometers inside a mountain with no natural light and to paint these bizarre paintings on the walls. And what they discovered many years later was that um, a shaman, uh, a priest as it were, would uh, take an initiate into the cave and they would spend days in there until after a period of sensory deprivation. So after the senses no longer, be longer able to perceive things because it's so dark. Um, and when after a while, after performing uh, uh, hymns, uh, chanting hymns and performing prayers, etc., the initiate goes through a very profound spiritual experience. And then they would paint these experiences on the walls of the caves. So the cave is a kind of universal symbol uh, of a place that one enters into in order to enter into oneself. As it were, the physical entry into a cave is also a spiritual entry into one's heart. Note that in the cave of Hera, Ikra, his first revelation, it's no coincidence it happened. This first revelation happened when he was in solitary meditation. So its most important theme of the cave is birth and rebirth or death and resurrection. Death to what exactly? It's not a physical death, of course. It's a symbolic spiritual death. But it is death to the ego, love, death of love of this world, and death of the illusory reality projected by the ego. So it is basically a kind of fana, a kind of annihilation of the ego to open up a space for uh, the, the, the traces of the divine names and one's higher self to appear. And it's a resurrection to what? It's a resurrection to, in, and with God, or Baka, subsist with God. It's the fana of the ego in order that one may subsist only with God i.e. it's an attempt to be absent from everything in the world in order to be purely present only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> so quick comment on the fat here. It's not entirely clear how much time had passed between taking refuge in the cave and their dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fat suggests a direct link between taking refuge in God and their calling upon him. Um, but the link here is not necessarily only a temporal one, although fat usually suggests an event that's following immediately after another one. Um, that's not the only uh, connection that the fat is establishing here. The, the link is primarily a spiritual and existential one, in my opinion, and in according to some of the commentary that I've read. He who seeks protection only in God, therefore that person calls only upon him. So the fact that the fitya seek refuge in God in the cave, uh, the reflection of this state, the reflection of this mode of being is that they only call upon God. They didn't seek help from anyone else. They only call upon God. And so he who knows that God is musaddib al-asbab, he or she who knows that God is the, the causes, all the causes in the universe relies only uh, on God. And so the, what the Quran here and what this particular verse is revealing to us is, uh, um, is a different kind of link between things. It is teaching us, it is educating us in a different connection between things.
Okay? In this instance, it's a connection between uh, seeking refuge in God or uh, being a believer, seeking refuge in God, and then calling only upon God, who is Musabbib al Asbab. And so then they perform this dua. But notice, up until this point, we are, uh, uh, are listening to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, relate this story to us. And then suddenly, we, you, the reader, are now calling upon God with this glorious supplication. This dua is, some, is often repeated by Muslims all the time. But if the way it's articulated in the Quran is as if uh, any one of us could be standing um, in place of these fitya and reciting this uh, or calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so indeed this shift in the Quran in pronouns and the shift in first person to second person to third person uh, constantly in the Quran um, is constantly shifting this perspective, um, alerting us to uh, different modalities of receiving uh, and, and relating to the text. And so if we have truly understood the meaning of verses 7-8, which came before, which are the verses, So we have made everything upon the earth an ornament to it, so that we may test them. Um, and we are then reducing it all to a Sa'id and Juruza. So Sa'id and Juruza is like, um, imagine an earth with beautiful meadows and hills and flowers and trees. And then all of a sudden, it's a, a flattened plateau of dust and rubble. That's the powerful image conveyed in that verse. What Allah SWT is saying is that the zina of the other, he's not saying that beauty in this world is uh, not real. No, but when beauty no longer leads back to the one who gave it beauty, al-jameel, uh, then it becomes a bruise, it becomes a snare, it becomes a trap that draws us into a purely material appreciation of a world that's shining and dazzling and everything within it. And caught in this kind of uh, snare, as it were, uh, where we are, we fall into uh, we fall into uh, a state in which we no longer recognize things as they are. Um, so the Quran is really alerting us to the reality uh, of things, and the story grips us. The story of these fitya who go into this cave, and whom we can really place ourselves in their shoes. Um, instead of the Quran saying it awal fitya to il kahfi. Uh, and they called upon God to help them. It says, And then it quotes directly what they said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is something that we can put ourselves in that those same shoes and say say those. Um, and the, the story grips us, of course, because it, it gives expression to a parallel process in our soul. If we're really following the, the story, and we're really feeling these connections and these illusions. Uh, the moment we get to this verse, فَقَالُوا It is we who are now turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our state and saying, رَبَّنَا آتِينَا بِلَا دُنْكَ رَحْمَةً وَهَيِّئَ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا We are now the fitya calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're no longer listening to God narrating a story or relating a story. We are now in the story. We are in the cave. And we are calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A very powerful way in which the Quran grips us and draws us in as active participants in the actual story itself. Returning to the original primordial state of the fitra is tantamount to attaining once more to the freshness of youth. This is a very, very important point. We're now drawn into the story. We're drawn into reclaiming this uh, the state of futuwa within ourselves. Um, uh, it's something we all aspire to achieve indeed. And so the story shifts and it is now we who speak, as I said earlier, we are the ones who speak and call upon Allah wa ta'ala. What are you or the youth asking for? They or you are asking for guidance and compassion because you have understood or we have understood or they have understood that God is Musabib al Asbab, and so only on Him uh, can we uh, rely. 
again, فضربنا. The fad does suggest an immediate temporal link, as I said earlier, between their dua and what God will do to them next. But that is not all. They were inspired by God to take refuge in the cave. One wonders, therefore, how long it took before they were put to sleep. Imagine these youth entering into the cave. As active participants in this story, we cannot but live it. We entered into the cave and we've called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How much time between calling upon him and, and then um, going to sleep? Did they undergo some kind of initiation? Did they perform dhikr? Did they perform prayers? Was it a, a few hours or days? How were they put to sleep? We're kind of left in suspension, really. But the connection established between the fa gives us not the how they fell asleep, but the why. And that's what's so important. I.e. not how they were put to sleep, but why they were put to sleep. This is all that really matters. Later, we will see that people argued over their situation. How many people were they? Who were they? What were their names? How did they sleep? How long, you know, all these details that are irrelevant because what really matters is why they were put to sleep. And we saw that um, earlier, they are fitya. Um, and we're going to come back to this later when we elaborate on the story a little bit more. Darabna, um, so far God is in the background telling us as a story, eh? up until this point, they who sought refuge in a cave, a description. We, gain, we then get involved with our own deha. And then all of a sudden, like a clap of thunder, the divine interjects with a divine royal we. Fadarabna, we, all the active uh, divine voice now is in the relating the story directly as a first person. He strikes them on their ears, even though it is metaphorical of covering their ears and putting them to sleep. It, the image is evocative. It's a moving verbal image, as I said earlier, as I said earlier in the previous lesson. Darabna ala adhani was a very powerful image of almost strike, almost striking them into a deep slumber and sleep. The divine interjections throughout the text remind us at crucial points of the story who is the real author of events? We are now the spectators, once again, of these youth who are put to sleep and we watch on to see what God will do to them or to us. I'm gonna move a little bit faster because we're running out of time. I don't wanna exceed the one, one and a half hour, inshallah. Their ears, why the ears? Well, they are asleep in the cave beyond any possible interruption. <clears throat> the only thing that could possibly wake them up is a loud sound from outside. So some of the commentators say, the reason why the ears are mentioned is because when you go to sleep, I mean, the only thing that can really wake you up is either you're violently shaken up physically by someone or a loud sound. So God expresses this covering over of the ears uh, that he put them to sleep. But note, he didn't say that he that he um, he took away their hearing or their listening, sorry. Okay? The expression is very powerful in Arabic. Uh, there is more. Deep in the cave, they must have experienced sensory deprivation. Their bodily preparation is necessary, necessary for what is to come. And I'll come, comment more on this later when we talk about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns and tosses them over throughout the cave. But there's also a symbolic and spiritual significance to cover up sleep over their ears. <clears throat> we took their physical hearing so that they may only spiritually hear from us. We took their physical seeing so that they may only spiritually see us. This is so that they do not turn their attention in fact, to any other than us and that others do not reach them either. This is a, in one of the spiritual commentaries on the Quran where it is said, that Allah Ta'ala took their, their outer hearing from them, but not their inner hearing. He took their outer sight from them, not their inner sight, um, which means that they're, that, that they're entering into a deep slumber, that it is really a deep spiritual experience. We'll see later that when they wake up, it's not so much that they were unconscious necessarily for 300 years, but that they were tarrying and in the presence of Allah in a different dimension of time and space itself. In this sense, although they are physically asleep, they are awake spiritually. While most of us must die to wake up, according to the traditions that are often ascribed to the Prophet but are perhaps more accurately ascribed to Imam Ali, 
uh, die before you die. Um, uh, and the other tradition also, uh, most of us have to die to wake up because in this world we are in a dream. Um, the fitya here get an opportunity to wake up within their dream. So the world is a dream. And when they went to sleep, they didn't dream, they woke up. And that's the beauty of the story. They, they have been put to a symbolic death and annihilation or fanat from their humanity so that they may subsist uh, with their Lord. <clears throat> Thumma, how long has passed? Thumma uh, does not necessarily, uh, it means a succession of events, but not necessarily indicating time. So, <clears throat> Thumma, so from one verse to the next, we immediately move from, uh, we know that 300 years have gone by because later in the Quran, we, we discover that many centuries have gone by. But the verse <clears throat> does not seem to suggest that. Um, isn't, it isn't immediately clear from the verse. We know from the later verses that, of course, it was... Uh, so at this point of the story, if we haven't read on the rest of the, uh, the, the story, we're left in suspension. However, the focus is not on how long did they sleep, but on the fact that God is who brought them back to life. Also, again, the divine here, we note the, the clap of thunder again. Hmm? The clap of thunder, the divine we interjects again, because to, to help you realize the most important realization here, it is he who brought them to life. Anything that happened in between is irrelevant. This is what matters. God operates beyond our limited understanding of the laws of the cosmos. And so this immediately throws us, if we are following uh, the, the, the story as it unfolds, it immediately throws us into a whirlwind. Resurrection is here and now the hour is near. It's apocalyptic. Every verse of the Quran reminds us constantly of the hour. Every verse of the Quran is it stands alone as almost uh, apocalyptic in the sense that each one is a call to death and resurrection. In every uh, verse of the Quran, we are reminded that this world is ephemeral and that the, the afterlife is real. So in this sense, in every verse, we are constantly uh, 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 confronted with what is really real. Some pious scholars, when they used to get to some of these verses, uh, or many other verses in the Quran, they would fall into a swoon, so deeply uh, um, immersed in the Quran and its recitation, that the meanings themselves throw up deep, profound psychological, existential, spiritual responses. Some of them would fall unconscious. Some of them would would would, uh, would, 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 would weep for hours. This is the real effect of this cold faqil that we talked about um, uh, earlier. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to leave it at that, inshallah. Um, I don't want to go on. Um, I have a few more slides here, but we're not going to talk about inshallah. Uh, we'll do that later. Um, I will go back to uh, the screen where we can. I can see the um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the questions. If there are any questions, please do uh, ask now. Um, otherwise, uh, inshallah, I'll um, I won't take Q and A right now. What I'll do is um, you can post the questions in the comment section of the video, inshallah. Let's do that. Post the questions in the comment section of the video, inshallah, and uh, I'll look, go through them by next week and I'll try to answer them next week, inshallah, as I did this week. So this week I went through the comment section from last week and I jotted down as many questions as I could um, to, uh, I could write down, inshallah. Okay. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa razukna attiba'ah wa arina al-baathila baathilan wa razukna ishtinaba wa salli allahumma ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته